Hello, I'm Professor Alviso, and this is a video for Multicultural Music in America. This video will cover Native American music and culture. Native American music and culture is a very vast topic, and we're just going to skim the surface and talk about just a little brief overview of some of the regions and some of the roles that music plays in culture. So let's get started. In this video, we will study the history and interaction of Native Americans with other Americans. We'll explore the connections between music and ritual. And although much Native American music might all sound the same to you, within a short time, you'll learn how to distinguish music from various regions in the United States. Here we go. No one knows exactly when the first humans came to the Americas, some scientific evidence places it at about 27,000 years. Other evidence goes back as far back as 100,000 years. Some Native American groups say that they've been here since the beginning of time. But most scientists will say that people first came to the Americas via the land bridge between Siberia and Alaska at least 27,000 years ago. People on this continent survived by hunting and gathering for the most part, and later developed agriculture. As a matter of fact, a lot of the crops and the foods that you take for granted were actually cultivated by the Native Americans that lived in the Western Hemisphere. These common foods include corn, potatoes, tomatoes, chocolate, tobacco, peppers, and many other kinds of foods for which it would be impossible to imagine life without. Corn cultivation is considered one of the greatest agricultural developments in history, and corn is one of the two most important crops on the planet. Depending on how people lived, there were two different kinds of housing. The one you might be more familiar with, uh, photo, uh, pictured in that top photo is a teepee. And teepees were important for people who migrated, especially those tribes that migrated in the Great Plains following herds of buffalo. Teepees are portable, so they could be moved from place to place and set up somewhat quickly to provide excellent shelter. A more permanent kind of housing is called a hogan by the native uh, by the Navajo people in Arizona. And a hogan is made out of earth and other materials to create a structure that remains cool in the summer and warm in the winter. There's a hole at the top of the hogan and a fire is set in the middle of the hogan to keep one warm and the hole allows smoke to escape. The uh, door of a hogan and teepee for the most part, uh, always uh, faces east to greet the warmth of the rising sun. A tribe is a group of people with shared language, ancestry, customs, music, religion, and way of life. And according to most anthropologists, there are at least 200 distinct tribes that uh, that lived and still live in the U.S. Native American culture largely revolves around the idea of maintaining harmony and balance with nature. So respect for natural things and understanding of the balance of nature is needed in order to be able to survive. Religion revolves around the idea that the Great Spirit lives in all things natural, not only humans and animals, but plants, rocks, water, etc. And these are all things that one must pray for whenever you take anything from the earth. To Native Americans, when they saw Europeans coming across the plains and destroying forests and clearing land in order to build housing and settlements, it seemed to them that they hated nature. It seemed that the Europeans disliked nature 
and wanted to destroy nature because their ways seemed so alien to Native Americans. It is difficult to really estimate the population of Native Americans in the U.S. before the arrival of Europeans. Most estimates would say that there was somewhere between 1 and 2 million Native Americans in continental U.S. in 1776. That population dwindled down to about a quarter million from wars and disease and annihilation and extermination by the 1890s. 1890 is seen as the last state of the last uh, Native American and um, American skirmish uh, or battle, the Battle of Wounded Knee. Today, the estimate is that there's somewhere around 2.75 million Native Americans in the United States. And what is defined as a Native American um, is, is sort of a, a little bit of a moving target depending on um, how the tribe defines it. New York City, being the most populous city in the United States, has the largest Native American population, but is followed closely by Los Angeles that has a higher percentage of Native American people. Many Native Americans live in cities and integrate with other Americans. Some Native Americans, though, choose to remain on reservations. These were land grants that were set aside for Native American tribes by the U.S. government. Uh, most of them are operated like their own state with their own government, police, social services, and laws. And many of you will recognize the location of some of these reservations because very often, at least here in California, there is a casino um, built on the land because they have different laws for gambling. And Native Americans have been relocated throughout history in the United States as um, Europeans came settling. Uh, Native Americans were relocated uh, over and over and over. Um, the most famous relocation, or I should say infamous, is the Trail of Tears. That's when approximately one-third of the Cherokee Nation uh, and other local tribes died in the relocation of those tribes from Georgia to the state of Oklahoma. There's much more we can say about Native American history, and we will come back to some issues later, but let's move on to musical characteristics. Much Native American music has a single melody with no chords, so the vocal texture is monophonic and often singing will be accompanied by drums or rattles. The flute is the exception to this. It's one of the few melodic instruments that you'll find in Native American culture. And it was present in the Northern Plains and usually only played by the males to court and woo females. The form of much Native American music is very basic, uh, sometimes just one melody repeated over and over, strophic melody uh, or strophic form, uh, each time with different words. Other times there would be a binary form where there were two different parts to the melody that would repeat over and over, A, B, A, B, etc. Very often, Native American melodies start high and descend down uh, in each phrase, and then a new phrase will begin high and descend down to the end of the phrase. Much Native American music has words. Often, though, the music will be composed of vocables. These are sung syllables with no specific meaning. Some Native Americans will say that uh, it is in an ancient language for which the exact translation has been forgotten. Nevertheless, even if some music uses vocables, sometimes those songs with vocables or just sung syllables are considered the most religious or the most spiritual songs because they talk in a language directly to 
the Great Spirit. Native American music is most often connected to ceremony, and since religion is linked to nature, I like to think that those three things, music, nature, and religion, are inextricably linked. Most Native American uh, groups will say that individuals shouldn't take credit for new songs. New songs are always being composed, but typically the person that brings the song to the tribe will say, will give credit to the Great Spirit and say that the song was brought to them in a dream or the song was given to them um, by, by the Great Spirit and they will not take credit for it. There are exceptions to many of the things that I've just mentioned above. There is no one kind or one style of Native American music or one thing that you can say about all Native American music. But for the most part, the things that you see in this slide are general characteristics that you find shared among Native, many Native American tribes. Even though it's difficult to generalize, many scholars define the tribes and place them into various regions that seem to have similar cultural and musical characteristics. The eastern part of the United States that you will see in this map that includes the green as well as the purple uh, on the right are considered the eastern woodlands. And some of the tribes in the southeast are somewhat different than the eastern woodlands in terms of their culture, but musically, both the eastern woodlands and the southeast share a lot of characteristics. So we're just going to lump them together for the purposes of this short video uh, and call that entire eastern part the eastern woodlands. The middle part of the U.S. Uh, is called the Great Plains. It extends from Texas all the way up north through Canada. These are the areas with grasslands where buffalo used to roam in large numbers. As we get further west, the regions become much more diverse. Uh, you have tribes in the southwest in states like Arizona and New Mexico, as well as a different region and a different cultural background and musical characteristic in the areas called the Great Basin and Plateaus. And on the coast of California and the northwest coast, you have uh, very different kinds of ways of life and cultural and musical characteristics. In this video, we're mostly going to focus on the eastern part of the United States, uh, the eastern woodlands, the middle part, the Great Plains, and we'll talk a little bit about music from the southwest and Great Basin area. As mentioned before, the eastern woodlands is that eastern part of the United States uh, along the Atlantic coast that we're going to consider for this video from approximately the states of Florida and Georgia north into Maine. But it goes also as far west as the Ohio Valley and parts of the Midwest. Tribes in this region uh, develop city and had well-developed agriculture, as well as hunting and gathering. Musically, there are three things that I'm going to say will help you identify music from this part of the United States. Typically, the vocal timbre, the sound of the voice, tends to be open and relaxed. Basically, what many people would just say, a normal voice. Music in this area, though, is highly identifiable because of the presence of call and response. And you won't find call and response in any other region in the U.S. except for the eastern tribes. It's the only region of the United States that has call and response singing. Accompaniment to the vocals tends to be either a light soft drum or rattles. Very different than what you're going to find, say, for instance, in the Great uh, planes, where the drum is much louder, much deeper, and much more prominent. An example of a an eastern woodlands uh, music and dance would be the Cherokee stomp dance. This is a circle dance 
which uses a shuffle step around a fire. And it's a group of people uh, stepping around uh, a fire in a counterclockwise motion. And the dance leader is also the song leader. So the, the, the leader will sing a phrase and it is repeated in a call and response fashion by the group. And uh, the leader will also lead the dancers in various dance steps. If we have time, I'll show you a video of Cherokee Stomp Dance. Let's listen to an example of music from the Eastern Woodlands. Example 214 is the Seneca Alligator Dance song. Now, I usually don't ask you to memorize the titles of songs in this particular class, but it is helpful to see everything that's involved in this uh in this piece or some of the things that are alluded to by the title. The Seneca are a tribe that lived in the New York area, part of the Iroquois people. And in this piece, they're honoring the alligator through song and dance. What's interesting is that there are no alligators in New York. And in essence, this shows that these tribes uh, really did interact and share a lot of cultural values. Uh, the alligator, alligator comes uh, is mostly associated with the land south in Florida. Uh, so clearly, the Seneca traded with the groups that lived down south, like the Cherokee and the Seminoles. And um, this song and this dance honors the alligator. Uh, so again, you can see in this example. Uh, the function involves religion, dance, and honoring nature all in one. The form of this song is binary. So you will hear two clear sections separated by uh, uh, sort of a long yell. And in the A section, what we're calling the A section at the beginning of the song, you will hear everyone singing in unison. And then you will hear a call and the leader will and, and the group will go into a call and response. And then another call, and they'll go back to unison, and then call and response, and the song just progresses from there. A, B, A, B, binary form. You will hear uh, everyone singing in unison, a single melody with rattle and a light drum in the background. And you will note that the voice is somewhere on the open and relaxed kind of vocal timbre. Let's give this a listen. Thank <laughs> you. 
Now that we've learned a little bit about what the music sounds like from the eastern woodlands, let's move to the middle part of the United States, the Great Plains. The music from this part of the U.S. and the tribes that originate from this part of the U.S. has a very different sound. The first things you will notice about the music is that there's a strong and deep drum sound which represents the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And the voice is strong, nasal, powerful, tense, and high and piercing. So it's a very, very powerful sound, not the open and relaxed sound that we heard in the Eastern woodlands. And there is no call and response in music from the Great Plains. Very often you'll see and hear this music played at powwows, and people will gather around the drum, as you see here, and many people will sit around and play the drum, and that provides this strong sound to accompany the powerful voice. The grass dance song, example 215, is a good example of the sound that you hear uh, very often in music from the Great Plains. And the grass dance song, obviously from the title, falls within the same category that we talked about with the Seneca alligator dance song. Uh, the functions include dance, honoring nature, and that is all tied to religion and the worldview of Native Americans in this part of the U.S. Let's give it a listen. Let's talk a little bit about some of the cultural characteristics you'll find among the tribes that lived in the Great Plains. As I've said before, geographically, this covers the middle part of the U.S. from Texas north to the Canadian border, including states like Oklahoma, Nebraska, Kansas, North Dakota, South Dakota, as well as parts of Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana. The common cultural traits of this area is that the people often lived in a migratory fashion, 
using the teepee and following herds of American bison. Sometimes we refer to these as buffalo, but the uh, official term is the American bison for this animal. And from the bison, they were able to get everything they needed practically in order to survive. Food, clothing, housing, weapons, tools, and medicine. And it's estimated that there were 20 million bison living in this part of the U.S. Um, in the 1700s, but because of the settlers and the pioneers coming westward, uh, these numbers dwindled down to approximately 60 in 1890. Today, the herd has increased to about a half a million. And if you go to national parks like Yellowstone, you'll find many bison in the area. Because the bison provided everything for the tribes that lived in the plains, um, the U.S. government knew that killing the bison would basically starve the Native American tribes into submission so that they can put them on reservations, and that's exactly what happened. The music from this area, uh, as I've said before, is high and tense as far as the vocal timbre, a piercing voice, I would say. The melodic contour is strongly descending, where you'll hear each phrase starting high and descending down to the end of the phrase. And very often at the beginning of a song or at the beginning of a phrase, you'll hear a song leader sing the first line by himself or herself, and then others join in in unison. Again, the drum is thought to be the heartbeat of Mother Earth. And you will hear this style of music if you ever go to a powwow. A powwow is a gathering of tribes for sharing of culture and these days friendly competition. There'll be prizes given for the best regalia or costume, as well as the best dancers. Here's another example of a Plains song and dance piece called the Plains Rabbit Dance. And this one is quite different. Um, this is a social dance where men and women dance together, and you'll see some and here's some English lyrics thrown in if you listen very carefully. Uh, so listen to uh, the second verse where the singer and the singers go into an English verse where they sing, Hey, sweetheart, I always think of you. I wonder if you were alone tonight. I wonder if you were thinking of me. And this kind of humorous uh, verse obviously shows that it is not a deeply spiritual or religious song. Again, there's exceptions to all the different general characteristics that we're talking about here. So I'm throwing this in here as another example of uh, music and dance that you might find from the Plains area. And you will notice that very similar to the previous example, the grass dance, you'll hear a very deep drum. Let's give it just a little listen, and I'll stop it right after the English verse. That way, if you miss it, you can rewind it a little bit. Here we go. Although no one knows exactly where this document came from, the Native American Ten Commandments, uh, many people believe that the origin uh, resides in some of the tribes that lived in the Southeast, like the Cherokee and the Bird Clan of Alabama. But I do think it's interesting uh, in comparison to our Western Ten Commandments that come from the Bible. Um, so this is something that you might see posters of 
and it just displays some of the common beliefs you find among many Native American groups. Uh, treat the earth and all that dwell thereon with respect. Show great respect for your fellow beings. Work together for the benefit of all mankind. Give assistance and kindness wherever needed. Look after the well-being of mind and body. Remain close to the Great Spirit. Do what you know to be right. Dedicate a share of your efforts to the greater good. Be truthful and honest at all times. And take full responsibility for your actions. I would say for me personally, this strikes closer to home as uh, a moral guide to live by. And what strikes many people about these commandments are that versus the Christian Ten Commandments, it focuses more on what you should do rather than on what you shouldn't do. And of course, the biblical Ten Commandments are rooted in a particular historical context. Uh, but the Native American Ten Commandments also focus more on the importance of nature and community. Um, which again sort of highlights some of the different cultural um, leanings that you might find among Native American tribes that differ from Europeans. I won't go into a lot of detail here in this section um, because I have stories that go along with each one of these things that I've experienced um, in my quest to find out more about Native American uh, culture and music. Uh, I've went through many dozens of sweat lodges. These are purification ceremonies for the mind and body. And in the photo there to the right, you will see a fire. Uh, underneath the fire um, are stones, rocks that are being heated to be brought inside the, the dome covered structure there um, that's covered by carpet. It's usually willow branches covered by carpeting. And you bring those hot rocks into the middle of the dome. You close the carpeting door that covers it. And you're in the dark and you throw water. Um, you splash water onto the rocks and create your own sauna. Uh, this is a group activity typically. And while you're in there, you're praying and singing to be able to clear yourself and cleanse yourself of anything that's holding you back from leading a better life. Um, I've had incredible experiences in sweat lodges, and I hope that if you are ever uh, invited to one by a person that runs an authentic Native American style sweat lodge, that you will take them up on the offer. Uh, but it may be one of the most difficult experiences you ever go through, not only physically, but mentally. And it makes you realize that so much of the strength you need to get through anything in life, be it a sweat lodge or a marathon, which I've run many of as well, uh, involves really more mental strength than it does physical strength. Sweat lodges remind me of that many times uh, because even though I've run marathons and been through uh, all kinds of physical trials, uh, nothing compares with the nothing compares with the first sweat lodge that I went through. It was one of the most difficult experiences of my life, but I'm glad I did it. I've also been uh, through peyote ceremonies on the uh, Diné or the Navajo reservation in Arizona. These are all night prayer ceremonies where peyote is used as a sacrament, uh, much in the same way that tobacco is used by some tribes and holy water is used in Catholic churches. Uh, so the peyote is not used to simply get high. It is used as a way to uh, pray for a better life and to see visions for a better tomorrow. I've also helped many people through vision quests. These are um, things that you prepare for for a long time, but you go out into the wilderness in the old days, it would be four days and four nights without food and water completely naked. Uh, these days, uh, for the most part, people will bring clothing so that they can remain warm. Uh, but the idea is to go out into the nature by yourself and again, sort of have some kind of uh, clearing of the mind 
and hopefully get some kind of visions of what you need to do to be a better person and to be in better balance with the earth and uh, lead a better life and help others uh, in the process as well. The most serious of all the ceremonies that I've experienced uh, is a sun dance. And I haven't done a sun dance myself, but this is four days and nights of nonstop dance around uh, a central pole, which represents the, the, the center of Mother Earth. And uh, sun dancers are attached to this pole by a rope. And the end of the rope is actually uh, includes a hook that goes right through your body, usually through your chest, uh, so that you are connected to the earth and um, and you dance for four days and four nights without stopping. Um, and again, this is a way that Native Americans believe that they can sacrifice something and sacrifice physical uh, comfort to be able to pray for a better life. Um, Again, I hope you have the chance sometime in your life to experience any of these things because um, they're incredibly enlightening and teach you a lot about yourself as well as Native American culture. Let's move on and talk just briefly about the Southwest. And the major tribes in this area are the Apache and the Navajo. Um, both of whom sort of have a lot of similarity when it comes to music and ceremonies because they often focus on healing the sick and a lot of the musical characteristics are similar. Um, again, the religion focuses on healing the sick, but because of where this these tribes are located geographically, they also often pray for rain, which can be, as you well know, since we do live sort of in this area as well, rain could be quite sporadic and unpredictable. Um, but also a lot of the religion focuses on honoring nature and spirits, just like the tribes in other parts of the U.S. Two examples of Apache and Navajo dance are the Apache social dance, where men dance together holding hands in a line, and the rhythm is fast, vocal range is narrow, and kind of nasal vocal timbre. Uh, you'll find a lot of syllables sung, vocables, and both the Apache and the Navajo use a water drum. The Apache water drum is an iron kettle half filled with water, and water splashes against the drum head and creates a unique sound, as well as changing the pitch of the drum at times. The Navajo enemy way ceremony's purpose is to ward off the spirits of slain enemies. Since we've talked about so much about how Native Americans respect life, how do you deal with going to war with someone and killing someone? Well, this is one of the ways they deal with it. If they ever kill someone, they have to pray to the spirit of that slain enemy to ensure that the relatives or the associated spirits of that slain person won't come and harm the, the warrior and his family. So in this ceremony, uh, it's a circle dance and the melody is highly descending. Again, similar to Apache music, the vocal range is narrow and there's a nasal kind of timbre to the voice. And the Navajo use water drum as well, but their water drum is a clay drum half filled with water. Uh, as opposed to the Apache iron water drum. This example from the Navajo exemplifies that music is also used for work. Example 217 is the Navajo corn grinding song. And in this excerpt, you'll hear a solo woman singer uh, grinding corn, very similar to what you see in the photo. And the song includes some vocables as well as text. And again, the function is to work. In other words, provide some singing and some music to pass the time to keep the mind off of the tedious work that the woman is doing uh, to set a tempo for the work. Um, so music and work often go together. Um, but at the same time, the woman is honoring the spirits and the corn spirits that brought this corn to her so that she can grind it to feed her family. Let's give it a listen. I, 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 
The next region we're going to cover is the Plateau and Great Basin. Geographically, this includes part of Eastern California, east of the Sierras, as well as states uh, like Nevada and Utah. The vocal timbre tends to be soft and more hymn-like, and the form is often binary, A-A-B-B, A-A-B-B, as you will hear in the song that I'm going to play in a few minutes. This area is remarkable because of uh, a very important movement that originated in the area uh, called the Ghost Dance Religion, which started around the seven, 1870s and went up until 1890. This was a song and dance form, the purpose of which was to appeal to ancestors to make the white men disappear and bring back dead Indian ancestors to life, to bring back happier times, and to bring back the buffalo. And it began um, around the 1880s from a medicine man named Wavoka, who's pictured above. And Wavoka had this vision that if uh, Native Americans uh, did a certain kind of dance and song and wore special ghost shirts, that the ancestors would come back to life, time would return to what it was like before the Americans or Europeans uh, came to the area and happy times would be restored. What do Native Americans do whenever um, they, they can't change reality? Um, they appeal to the ancestors in song and dance. And this is really what was happening uh, after the Civil War when uh, the U.S. Army turned its attention to bringing into submission all the remaining Native American tribes in the Great Plains and the Western United States. So there was a lot of suffering, a lot of war, a lot of battles that took place uh, all the way up into 1890. And the ghost dance religion was a way in which uh, they were appealing through song and dance to resist uh, the reality of what was happening, even though they were outnumbered and even though they were certainly out-weaponized by the American government. Um, at the Battle of Wounded Knee, while a group of ghost dancers were doing the ghost dance, which was outlawed by the U.S. government um, as soon as it appeared because the government was uh, threatened that Native Americans would rise up and, and continue to fight against uh, being placed in reservations. Um, so the army uh, came in and killed ghost dancers. Um, and it was uh, how the, the battle started still has a lot of controversy, but uh, things were sort of peaceful and Native Americans stopped the ghost dance when the army came in and told them to stop. But then later on, someone fired a weapon and that was the only excuse that the army needed to kill all these ghost dancers. Um, contextually, this was very soon after, uh, if you have ever heard of General Custer and um, the um, battle in which uh, Custer, uh, uh, Custer's army was killed by Native Americans in a battle. So the the army was sort of poised to want to get revenge to Native Americans for what had recently happened uh, in Custer's last stand. Um, after the killing of these ghost dancers in 1890 at Wounded Knee, uh, the ghost dance died away and a new style of um, Native American religion took hold, which is still with us today, called the Native American Church or the Peyote religion, which we're going to talk about in a little while. 
The ghost dance involved the wearing of special shirts and singing special songs and dances. There are many ghost dance songs. This one is a Shoshone ghost dance song that I really loved ever since I first heard it. The voice is soft and hymn-like and it has a binary form where you hear a phrase that is sung twice and then a different song, a phrase sung twice. So the form it continues like that in an A-A-B-B-A-A-B-B, etc. kind of form. It's just a single male singer and um, uh, this is sort of an example of music as a form of resistance against what was happening in the Great Plains and, and the West as uh, Americans came through uh, conquering um, Native American tribes. When I was doing the research for this class and this book, I got in contact with the ethnomusicologist who recorded this song way back in the 1930s. And at the time she was in her 90s and she went back because I was curious as to what the singer in this song was singing. And uh, she looked it up in her notes and sent me an email back and she said, uh, the singer is singing, um, spirit is standing and moving to the sky. Fog is standing and moving to the sky. And it, she said, provides this picture of, um, of a spirit, of a person who's died. And the spirit looks like fog and is standing from the body and moving up to the sky, which even made me think that this song is even more beautiful. I'd been listening to it for years before I knew what was being sung. I hope you enjoy it as well. And remember, this originates in an area not too far from uh, from Los Angeles, where I'm speaking from, uh, in Eastern California, Nevada, and Utah, the Plateau and Great Basin. Here is a Shoshone, a Shoshone ghost dance song. After the passing of the ghost dance religion, the Native American church or the peyote church took hold. Peyote is a cactus that has a, a slight hallucinogenic effect. And whereas the ghost dance religion sort of symbolized a, a kind of music and dance as a form of uh, protest and resistance, this is really more of music as a form of acceptance and escape. If you can't change reality, you have to figure out some kind of way to accept it and to find a place to escape from the harshness and the suffering of reality. And that is what the peyote church provides for Native Americans through all night ceremonies, a way to sort of envision a better future and deal with reality. The vocal tambourine range of peyote music is often soft and the narrow range, uh, and a narrow range, in other words, not a lot of notes and a soft voice. You can distinguish peyote 
songs from other Native American songs because they are usually quite fast and a little bit faster than you find in much other Native American music. So a fast tempo and like a lot of other Native American songs, a uh, very commonly descending kind of um, contour for each phrase where each phrase starts up high on a high note and then slowly comes down by the end of the phrase to lower notes. In this example, you'll hear a water drum, and at the beginning, I think around the five second mark, listen to how the pitch of the drum changes as water splashes against the drum head. Um, this kind of drum doesn't come across very well in recordings, but when you hear them played uh, live and you're close to it, you can hear what a, a really interesting sound the water inside the drum creates for the drum. Let's listen to uh, a, a listening example of peyote music. There are so many things to say about Native American music today. Um, in the background of this slide, you are hearing The Sacred Reed by R. Carlos Nakai, the best known Native American flute player and uh, recording artist. Um, in class, I'll play you some examples of other Native American uh, music um, that really spans the spectrum of folk and country and rock and alternative. The music listened to by most Native Americans today is American country music because for the most part, many Native Americans, especially those on reservations, still live very close to the heartland of America. So if you think of where many of the reservations are, they're located not close to the coast, but then in the interior of America where American country music is most popular. In actual performance, Traditional Native American music is always accompanied by the sounds of nature, the smell of fires and cooking, because it is performed within nature and within the context of ceremony. There are several examples of Native American uh, popular music for dancing. One of these is called Chicken Scratch, which you've already heard an example of. Uh, chicken Scratch is often also called Waila and it's music played by the Native American tribes that used to be known as the Pima and the Papago that are now known as the Tohono O'odham. And a lot of this music, if you listen to it, sounds very much close to Norteño style music. And again, that's because the Native Americans uh, live in and around states that have a large border population of Mexican Americans. So they've picked up musical and cultural characteristics from uh, Mexican Americans. So um, Waila or Chicken Scratch tends to be a little different from Norteño music. It sounds very similar, but it's often more instrumental uh, with fewer with less singing, and whenever they're singing, very often it's using Native American lyrics. And there's also less improvisation in the instrumentation as well. Uh, again, you heard an example near the beginning of class, uh, example 1-2, Old Man Rooster, which many of you probably mistook on prawn first hearing, like I did, uh, as a Norteño tune. Um, and there's so many other uh, examples of Native American popular music. Um, but I'm going to close uh, this section and this video on Native American music with uh, a video of a powwow. 
and hopefully you'll have a chance to experience a powwow at some point in your life um, because that's that's really one of the best opportunities for hearing Native American music in one of its current contexts when people get together to celebrate their culture um, and uh, it normally occurs on a large grassy area and there you will hear and see people playing a large uh, drum and uh, experience people in their full regalia uh, doing various kinds of dances and uh, also have the opportunity to experience Native American foods like Navajo tacos and uh, it's just a, a wonderful kind of event to uh, find out more about uh, this important group of people who were here thousands and thousands and thousands of years before any other uh, people came from uh, Europe, Africa, or Asia. So let's watch uh, an excerpt of a video from, uh, from a powwow so you can get an idea of some of the sights and sounds that happen. Yeah. 
Here you see the candy? Yeah. Four, get ready to three, run out. Yeah. Go, go get candy, go get candy. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Aaliyah, right there. Aaliyah, right there. Grab it. Grab it, quick. Hurry, hurry. Get smarty. <laughs> Grab a couple more. Uh, I see a couple Indian kids. Grab the lemon head. <laughs> this one. Awesome job there, Tyson. Clean it up, clean it up. That's good. I don't want to see no candy left. No candy left behind. No children left behind. Oh, lemon head. Grab that lemon head. Those are good. There you go. What did you all get? A bunch of party right here. Lemon hurry, hurry. Lots hurry. of yummy candy. In the next video, we'll move on to Japanese American music and culture, and we'll talk about a specific kind of Japanese American music called taiko drumming that reflects Japanese history in the United States and Japanese American identity. I'll see you soon.